Hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to today's webinar called What's New with AWS? My name is Mark Kulepista. I'm a technology evangelist at Amazon Web Services, working out of Singapore. In this webinar, we'll take a look at the new features and, and enhancements delivered over the past six months, so from March until today. This webinar is 201 level, so we assume that you have some familiarity with the AWS services and products. But we are not going to deep dive into any of the services or topics. Instead, we will highlight some of the most recent updates. Here we have a couple of housekeeping things. I will try to, try to run the presentation about 50 minutes or so. But while I'm presenting, we have the online questions and answers. There's a chat window. Please post your questions and our solution architects and my colleagues will help answer some of your questions while I'm presenting. Then at the end of the presentation, we have a common Q&A session where I will try to answer some more questions. And those questions that we don't have time to get to, we will contact you offline then. And then a big reminder, please fill in the survey at the end of the webinar and you will get $25 worth of AWS credits. Now, Let's start the webinar with a poll. I'd like to see how you prefer to manage your systems on AWS. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. So here you can see the poll results, and it looks like you prefer to use the AWS Management Web Console for managing your assets and services on AWS. And the second one is that you prefer to write code against the AWS APIs. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go on with the show. So first, an overview. What is AWS? This is a simple view of the set of services that we offer. At the core are the building block utility services, compute, storage, and data. Then we surround these offerings with a range of supporting components like management tools, networking services, and application services. All of these are hosted within our global data center footprint that allows you to consume the services without having to build or manage the infrastructure yourself. Then let's talk about innovation. Our pace of innovation at AWS is very quick. We have delivered over 100 new features, enhancements, enhance, <laughs> say again, enhancements and services to date in 2013. Now let's take a look at some of these innovations we have delivered over the past half a year. We start with the global infrastructure. We have nine independent regions with a total of 25 availability zones in AWS. And then we have now 42 edge locations. The edge locations support our global DNS service Route 53 as well as our CloudFront CDN. Recently we were excited to announce that Chennai and Mumbai in India and Seoul in South Korea were added to this list. This has helped our customers in or near those countries enjoy lower latencies and better user experience with content downloads. Now, let's move to the networking layer. Amazon Route 53 is our fast and fully managed DNS service. It lets you easily host your domain names and zones. Route 53 DNS servers will reply to your domain name queries with low latency and direct your customers to your service endpoints. For example, you can point them to your elastic load balancers, CloudFront distributions, or S3 buckets. Because remember, you can also host static websites out of S3 if you wish. The first new feature here is the DNS failover. Now you can configure Route 53 to perform health checks of your website's availability and in case your site has any issues, Route 53 can redirect your traffic to an alternate site. 
for example, it could be another copy of your primary system, or it could be the static S3 hosted website, which gives your customers access to at least static content while you fix your primary or dynamic system. For elastic load balancing endpoints, Route 53 evaluates the health of the load balancer itself, as well as the health of your applications running on EC2 behind the ELPs. If any part of the stack goes down, Route 53 detects the failure, routes traffic away from the load balancer, and directs it to another healthy ELP endpoint, for example. Route 53 DNS failover also supports EC2 endpoints, as well as endpoints in your own data centers. Now, here's an example of a CloudWatch health check graph of two different websites. You can see them in red and blue color here, monitored by Route 53. Note that these failures here of the websites were actually self-induced to get some <laughs> nice graphs here other than a flat graph on the top. Now, let's take a look at the most common core utility computing service. We start with Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2. There have been a lot of announcements for EC2 recently. Let's start with the price reductions. We've had several of those, including an up to 27% reduction of for Linux reserved instance prices for standard M1, second generation standard M3, high memory M2, and high CPU C1 instance families. And now, the reserved instances also provide savings of up to 65% compared to on-demand prices. You should definitely look at using reserved instances, especially for your heavy utilization baseload. And one handy way to check if this would help, help you uh, save costs is to leverage the AWS Trusted Advisor, and there's a free trial available of that. You can let it audit your system to optimize for costs and also availability, scalability, security, etc. aspects. We've also had an 80% price, price reduction for dedicated per region instances. An up to 37% price, price reduction for dedicated on-demand instances and an up to 57% price reduction for dedicated reserved instances. Dedicated reserved instances also provide additional savings of up to 65% compared to on-demand pricing. So please take a look at reserved instances for your heavy utilization base loads. Now, let's talk about VPC. VPC lets you create a virtual network of logically isolated EC2 instances and an optional VPN connection to your own data center. And remember, you can also combine that with Direct Connect if you want to bypass the internet and have your own dedicated connections to AWS. We wanted every one of our EC2 users to be able to benefit from the VPC enhancements with the advanced networking and other features available there. To enable that, now instances for new AWS customers and existing customers launching in new regions will be launched into what we call the EC2 VPC platform, or default VPC. Now, what is that? Now, you don't need to create a VPC beforehand anymore. You simply launch EC2 instances or provision services like Elastic Load Balancers or RDS databases like you would. And we will create a VPC for you at no extra charge. We will launch your resources into that VPC, and by default, assign EC2 instance that you provision there a public IP address. This option of allocating a default public IP address is also configurable. That's another new enhancement. So with default VPC, you can start taking advantage of VPC features like multiple IP addresses or ENIs, elastic network interfaces, changing security group membership on the fly, and, for example, adding egress filters to your security groups. However, if you prefer to work in the classic EC2 model that you're used to, or your tools and scripts are using, the default VPC behavior is backwards compatible with EC2 Classic. So everything should work as before for your systems. Here we have a couple of screenshots that show you how an account where EC2 VPC is configured 
is in use. Please note the parts highlighted in red. However, if you don't see this for your account, it means that you are using the EC2 Classic. This is the case if you have pre previously launched an EC2 instance in that region or provisioned services like ELP in that region before we change the behavior to default VPC. If this is the case for you and you want to start using the default VPC, you have two options. You can either create a new AWS account or you can pick a region that you haven't used yet. In addition to this default VPC and other enhancements, we now have four new EPS optimized instance types. Those are highlighted in red here. They have dedicated network throughput so that when you request EPS optimized instances, your volume performance will be more predictable and more consistent. You can use them with standard and provisioned IOPS EPS volumes. You could, for example, use the standard EPS volumes for dev and test or low volume traffic or storage like log files. And then you can change to or use additionally provisioned IOPS volumes for, for I.O. intensive workloads such as databases. So basically the thing to remember here is that EPS optimized instance types and provisioned IOPS EPS volumes go hand in hand. The recommendation is to use them together. Now, let's talk about ELP, our highly scalable elastic load balancing service. Starting recently, the ELP supports proxy protocol version 1. Now, how is this useful for you? Until now, you were able to identify the client IP address using HTTP or HTTPS protocol with the X forwarded for header. However, if you were using TCP as your traffic type, so some protocol over TCP, this X forwarded for header is not available because it's only in HTTP and HTTPS. Now we've added support for proxy protocol, which means that the ELP simply adds a human readable header with the client's connection information like source IP address to the TCP data that ELP forwards to your server, running in EC2. We have also added support for additional or all HTTP methods. Until now, ELP was supporting the most common HTTP methods for web services. But our customers have indicated that they would like more control over the HTTP methods. And now ELP accepts all HTTP methods sent to applications, including, for example, the patch method for Ruby on Rails, or the report or make calendar methods for CalDAV applications. So now the ELP is more flexible for different types of applications. Moving on, still in compute, let's talk about our Elastic MapReduce. So it's a fully managed, fully managed Elastic Hadoop and associated products cluster that lets you offload big data analytics running Hadoop job flows so that you don't have to manage the Hadoop, you don't have to configure it, install it, etc. You just execute job flows on top of it, leveraging it. The new announcements here are that we have joined forces with MapR. Until now, we had the M5 and M3 editions available. And the new feature is that you can also now choose the MapR M7 edition. This is very handy, enabling users to run basically 24-7 space applications in addition to the Hadoop ones. The MapR M7 architecture has several advantages, including instant recoveries from failures, consistently low latency, and full high availability. We've also added support for new versions of Hive and Pick, with many handy improvements in both. To learn more about those, please visit the EMR developer guide. Now, let's switch gears and move from computing to storage and CDN services. Here we have our EBS, the Elastic Block Store, allowing you to mount volumes to your EC2 instances. We have a couple of new features here. The incremental snapshot copy gives you the power to copy EBS snapshots across AWS regions. 
And now we made this snapshot copy much faster with the support for incremental copies. How it first works is that the first time you copy an EPS snapshot over volume to another region, all of the data will be copied, obviously. But the subsequent copy is the second copy, and the subsequent copies after that will be incremental. So we know which blocks of data have changed on the volume, and we will only transfer the changed blocks. And based on our findings, we expect to see up to 50 times speedups, so 50x speedups for the incremental copies of your snapshots. And very handily, the AMI copy feature leverages this. So now you have a really nice and easy way of replicating your custom AMIs between AWS regions. And this replication is significantly faster thanks to the incremental copy. This is a handy way to have a fast and reliable and repeatable way to replicate your application building blocks across multiple regions. We've also increased the provisioned IOPS maximum to 4,000 IO operations per second. And the maximum volume size is one terabyte. Provisioned IOPS is designed to deliver predictable high-performance IO for really IO-intensive workloads like databases or some enterprise applications. And remember, the recommendation is to use EBS-optimized instance types together with provisioned IOPS. Then, S3, Amazon Simple Storage Service. Good news for all the S3 users. Now we have reduced S3 request prices in all nine of our regions. We have lowered the prices for GET requests by 60% and the prices for PUT, LIST, COPY and POST requests by 50%. And we are super happy to pass along these savings to you as we continue to drive down our costs. And then, how do you get your data to S3? Well, one option is to use the storage gateway. The AWS storage gateway lets you marry your existing on-premise storage systems with the AWS cloud for backups, department file share, or disaster recovery, for example. And now, the addition is that we've added support for running the gateway appliance, or virtual machine, on Microsoft's Hyper-V environment. So now, now you can use either the Hyper-V virtualization or VMware ESXi to run the storage gateway appliance. Or you can run the storage gateway appliance on EC2 itself. And the two services that it provides are gateway cached volumes and gateway stored volumes. Please refer to the product pages on awsamazon.com for more information. Then, our CDN service, Amazon CloudFront. Now, we have two frequently requested features added. The first one is support for custom SSL certificates. And the second one is the ability to point the root of your website to a CloudFront distribution. With the support of both of these features, it's even easier now for you to deliver your whole, your entire website by your CloudFront's global network of edge locations. And as you can see there, we are really happy that India and South Korea have been added to the list. Here in this screenshot, you can see examples of these. To use these custom SSL certificates, you need to first purchase a certificate from a recognized certificate authority. Then you can upload the certificate to, to your AWS account and finally, you need to map your note that that's because they require dedicated IP addresses in each of the regions where you want to do this. The pricing is prorated for each hour of usage. If you want to learn more about the pricing, please see the CloudFront pricing pages. On this particular screenshot, you can see CloudFront hosting a root domain. So if you look at the top uh, red circle there, you can see that there's a domain summit.cloudfront.demo, cloudfrontdemo.com hosted, but also the main domain, cloudfrontdemo.com. So what is the significance of this? Now you no longer need to have a prefix like www in front of your domain name hosted here. 
So if your users just type in yourdomainname.com without, for example, www, you can now direct them straight to your website. And you don't have to use redirects anymore to achieve this. We've achieved this by allowing you to configure an alias or a record that maps the apex or root of your domain in Route 53 to your CloudFront distribution or, for example, to your Elastic Load Balance. Okay, moving on. Let's move to the next core utility layer, which is the data layer. And the first example here is Amazon RDS, or Relational Database Service, which supports Oracle, MySQL, and Microsoft SQL Server database engines. Recently, we were really excited to announce that RDS is now generally available. And with strong customer adoption across multiple market segments and numerous new features, a lot of operational experience behind us, we also have a service level agreement, or SLA, available now with 99.95% availability for multi-AZ database instances on a monthly basis. The SLA is available for RDS for MySQL and Oracle engines because both of these engines support the multi-AZ deployments. We've also increased the vertical scale-up maximums to 30,000 IOPS for the database instance and 3 terabytes of storage. This is applicable for both MySQL and Oracle database types. Then a couple of other points I'd like to make. Uh, we have major version upgrade to MySQL 5.5. So you can upgrade from an earlier version by modifying your database and changing the version to 5.5. The best practice to do this is to create a snapshot of your RDS, make a new instance from this snapshot, modify that, copy, and upgrade it to 5.5, and then test your applications against that. And then if everything is fine, you would like to repeat this for your production database. We've also added support for MySQL 5.6, and in the near future, we will be supporting also then major version upgrades to this. I'd like to highlight especially one of the new features available in MySQL 5.6, which is called binary log access. Now you can download and stream binary logs through the native MySQL bin log tool. This is really handy and useful for many, many purposes, like syncing data with an on-premise deployment, audit logging, maybe making analytics, and debugging for application errors. And for troubleshooting, we now have a really handy way for you to view the log files produced by the database engines either as a certain point in time, snapshot if you will, or not snapshot view, you can view, them, view the logs, you can watch them for real-time updates, or you can download the log files. The downloads can be achieved using the RDS download db log file command. Viewing and watching is also available on the web course. Then, to complement the RDS managed SQL databases, many people use the Elastic Cache service in front. Elastic Cache is a Memcached compatible caching layer that can help you offload frequently requested data from your backend databases. It can help you reduce the load on your database and other servers. And the announcements here are that it is available in Sydney region for our, for our friends and customers down under. We have enhanced cache nodes, M3, available in all the regions except Gulf Cloud. And we've also reduced the prices in US West and South America regions. So that's Elastic Cache. Moving on to our DynamoDB. DynamoDB is our provision throughput NoSQL database. It's super fast, it has predictable sub 10 millisecond performance. And it's fully distributed tolerant and it's zero maintenance. We have a lot of announcements here. We've fine-tuned our storage and our processing model. We've optimized our replication pipeline and taken advantage of our scale to drive down the hardware costs. As a result, we've been really happy to be able to reduce the prices for provision throughput capacity for reads and writes. 
by 35% and index storage by 75% in all the AWS regions. Furthermore, if you are able to predict your need for DynamoDB read and write throughput in the AWS regions that you use, you can now save even more with the new reserved capacity pricing model. If you need at least 5,000 reads or writes capacity units over a one or three year period, you can enjoy a lot of price savings, cost savings, that range from 54% to even 77% using the newly reduced on-demand price pricing. The net reduction of these price reductions with, with respect to the original pricing is up to 85% lower costs. So a lot of price savings with DynamoDB available. Then let's talk about using DynamoDB. Indexes. Until today you would have to select one of the following two primary key options when you create a table in DynamoDB. The first option was hash. Hash is a strongly typed value that uniquely identifies each item. DynamoDB allows then you to retrieve these items by their hash keys. And if you look at the picture here on the top left in blue, the country is the hash key in this example. Then the second option was hash plus range, which is a pair of strongly typed items that together form a unique identifier for each item in your table. And DynamoDB supports range queries that lets you retrieve some of the items or all of the items that match the hash portion of the primary key. And you can see that in the above example, the range key is the president number. So those are US presidents there. Now, with the recent release, we are extending this model with the support for up to five local secondary indexes per table. Each of these indexes references a non-primary attribute and enables efficient retrieval using a combination of the hash key and the specified secondary key. When you look at the bottom picture there, now you can retrieve the heads of state using the country and the ordinal number. But let's say that you want to also query by the age, the age when the president joined the office. You achieve this by creating the table on the bottom with the local secondary index mapped to the age column. Now today, the local secondary indexes must be defined at the time you create your DynamoDB table. But definitely in the future, we plan to provide you the ability to, to add or drop the secondary indexes for existing tables. If you want to equip an existing DynamoDB table with local secondary indexes immediately, you could do the following. You could export the data from your existing table using Elastic MapReduce and import it to a new table that you have created with local secondary indexes. We have information on the AWS Amazon.com website that show examples of using EMR to achieve this. Moving on. Amazon Redshift, which is our petabyte scale fully managed data warehouse service. Now, you can load multi-byte UTF-8 characters up to four bytes long into a var char field. This allows you to load a wide range of characters into Redshift. We've also simplified the data loading with support for scientific notations, automatic detection of date and time formats, and other improvements. Also, now you can share manual snapshots with up to 20 other AWS accounts. This is handy when you might want to migrate a cluster from a test account, for example, to a production account. The account under which the snapshot was created owns the snapshot, and that one controls of allowing and revoking access to the snapshot. The recipient account to which you allow access can only restore a new cluster from this snapshot. We have also a lot of other enhancements and features available, so please refer to the Redshift pages at aws.amazon.com for more information. Moving on, let's move up the stack. Let's move now 
to the application services. And we start with SQS, the simple queue service. This is really, really important. I cannot stress it enough because when you make a cloud native or cloud ready application, you want it to be loosely coupled. The looser you are coupled, the more you scale and the more resilient and self-healing your application can be. The, the queue enables you to decouple components, change your component internal implementation without affecting the calling parties. It can help you buffer, be closed between service components, etc. So this is a really, really important building block service when you make cloud native applications. And now the enhancement here is that we now support up to 256 kilobyte sized payloads for your messages that you put in, the, in your queues. Earlier the limit is almost 64 kilobytes. This means that actually if you want you can probably pass your payload or your actual content as a message between your services or components. The other option is that you pass an identifier or pointer to your object. For example, your, the object that you're working on in your application could be residing in S3, our simple storage service, and then the reference to this object can be passed as a message in the queue service. But with 256 kilobytes available per message, you can pass a lot more data using the queue itself. Then, a complementary service to this is our SNS, or Simple Notification Service. It's a really fast, flexible, and fully managed push messaging service. Basically, it allows you to push a message once and deliver it either to one recipient or multiple recipients. And you can group the recipients using topics. And now the new features and enhancements here are that SNS now supports push notifications to mobile devices using either Amazon, Apple, or Google devices. What are these push notifications to mobiles? Well, basically, they are short alert messages that you can send to your users even when they are not actively using the application. So it's background processing, and your application can notify the user that something is happening. For example, it can be that your flight is delayed, or that there's a storm coming, or that there's congestion on the roads that you're on, etc. So your application can pop up a message to the user in a handy way, and you can push the message from the server side. This experience is similar to SMS, but it costs a lot less because it uses Wi-Fi or cellular data for this message transmission. Well, this is all nice, but implementing push notifications can be really tricky, especially when you have multiple target platforms like iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire. So our customers tell us that this is exactly the kind of undifferentiated heavy lifting that they would like to us to solve on their behalf. So now we have enhanced the SNS service with mobile push. And it can let you transmit push notifications from your backend server applications on Apple, Google, and Kindle Fire devices using a simple and unified API. You can send messages to an individual device with direct addressing or to every device that is subscribed to a particular topic. Basically, this is then broadcast mode. And it also now supports up to 256 kilobytes payloads, like SQS. Then, SWF, Simple Workflow, workflow Service. This lets you build scalable and event-driven systems. So what is the difference to SQS? SQS is a queue that lets you loosely couple or decouple two services, a caller, a client, and a server, if you will. But if you have complicated execution logic with decision points, should I go here in my application logic or should I go there, based on the incoming messages, for example, the type of messages, if you have complicated logic, then the recommendation is to use SWF instead. So SWF can let you coordinate work across many machines, it can be either, they can be either cloud-based in EC2, or they can be on-premises. SWF handles the coordination, the logging, and the auditing, so you don't have to write glue code or maintain your own state machines, which can be really difficult. So SWF allows you to focus on your business logic that adds value to your business. 
Recently, we've announced a Ruby version of this called the AWS Flow, Frame, Flow Framework. So if you prefer to use Ruby, now it's even easier for you to use SWF using pure Ruby applications. We have pre-built objects and classes and they will communicate with the Simple Workflow API on your behalf. And you can see on the screen that you can just use gem install AWS Flow and get going if you prefer Ruby. Moving on. Elastic Transcoder. Obviously video is getting more and more popular. People are shooting a lot of videos on their mobile devices. And you would like to distribute this content, but you need to modify it to suit different devices. Something like an iPad with the Retina screen, Kindle Fire, Android, small flat screens. The users get a much better user experience if the content is optimized for their screen sizes. Also, you need to take into account the bandwidth, variable, transmission speeds, etc., latencies. So you it's not enough to have just one format of your source video. That's not giving optimal performance to different users. That's why it's really handy for you to use the Elastic Transcoder to offload this video transcoding to a service. And what are the new features and enhancements here? Well, first of all, now Elastic Transcoder supports the Apple HTTP live streaming or HSL. This means that it can create pre-segmented files and playlists for compatible players on iOS and Android devices that include also set-top boxes and web browsers. So that is a very popular way of transmitting video with modern devices. Also, we support now WebM outputs, which includes VP8 video and Vorbis audio for playback in browsers like Firefox. Basically, client types that don't support natively H.264 and AAC audio. We have also now support for MBEC2 transport streams. They are commonly used in broadcast systems. And very handily, based on customer requests, we have an enhanced Elastic Transcoder. Now you can have multiple outputs per job. So you can just specify that I want HSL, I want MBEC2, I want WebM, etc., etc. And from one source video with one job, you can get these multiple, multiple outputs. And where do they go? Well, they go to S3. And we have also enhanced the S3 output options. So, for example, you can set the access permissions, etc., directly from the Elastic Transcoder jobs. You don't need to modify them after the job finishes anymore. We have also automatic bitrate optimization. So the service will detect if you want based on the incoming video file, what is the optimal bitrate for this particular output type. And we support watermarking, so you can have up to four still images, and you can configure in different ways how this still image is then overlaid on top of the video. For example, as your company logo. Now, let's switch gears again and move even further up the stack to deployment and management services. And we start with our Elastic Beanstalk. Well, the recommendation is that you should offload your undifferentiated heavy lifting to services. You should focus on your business. And what is your business? It's probably creating the application business logic code. And everything else is what we call undifferentiated heavy lifting, managing infrastructure, platforms, databases, IP addresses, load balancers, etc. And Elastic Beanstalk really lets you do this. So in this picture, if you'll see on the top left there, you can see that all you need to do if you use Elastic Beanstalk is to deploy your application into Beanstalk and it will take care of the rest. What is the rest? Provisioning EC2 instances to run your code with the application containers, with the web servers, provisions if you want load balancers, auto-scaling groups, and even RDS databases in the backend. And it gives you a C name, so basically a domain name where you can direct your traffic. And if you integrate this C name with Route 53, you can have your own domain name uh, as the entry point for your customers. And what are the additions here? Well, Node.js is the first one. So we are really happy that now Elastic Beanstalk has recently added support for Node.js. 
There's also a new management console. Uh, and we support VPC, RDS, and configuration files. So you can configure those when you run your Elastic Beanstalk applications. We have also support for IAM roles, which are always recommended, especially in large enterprise situations. But in general, I recommend using IAM. Don't use your root AWS account, especially in production. Use IAM and specify who can do what for production, for dev and test, etc. It's a best practice. Another way of provisioning and managing your resources on AWS is to use CloudFormation. How does it differ? CloudFormation is what I call infrastructure as code. So basically, with CloudFormation, you can describe your entire service, your system in AWS, with a template file. It's basically a text file which is JSON formatted. And in this file, you can describe what are the resources, what are their dependencies, to build your entire system on AWS. And then, because it's a text file, it's code, you can store it in version control. And then you can achieve really nice continuous integration, continuous deployment workflows with that. And with CloudFormation, we have an enhancements added recently. And the first one is related to CloudFormation's performance. We now have support for parallel stack processing, meaning that CloudFormation can detect when you deploy a stack what activities can be running in parallel. So, for example, if you create multiple EC2 instances, it will start creating all of them at the same time. And you can have dependencies described there. So CloudFormation will know that it has to finish a certain job because there's a dependency for another service, for example. We have also nested stacks. We have an example of that in the next page. Here, it's a little bit hard to see, but on the top you see the top-level service credit by CloudFormation, your entire service, and it actually consists of three different nested CloudFormation templates. Those are corresponding with the different application tiers. For example, your web tier, your application tier, and your data tier. Also, we have smarts here. So if you modify your CloudFormation stack, let's say you modify a CloudWatch setting, CloudFormation knows which of the nested stacks this will impact. So if, for example, you use CloudWatch for the web service tier and the application tier, but not for the RDS, then when you do the modification on the top level stack, CloudFormation will apply it only for those nested stacks where it's applicable. So it doesn't unnecessarily modify a nested stack where you don't need to do this modification. However, excuse me, some people prefer to manage their resources in AWS using a nice web GUI. And for that, we have the OpsWorks service. OpsWorks is a DevOps-oriented application management service for end-to-end, -end flexible, and automated management for operational control. It uses a stack-based approach to build your services on AWS. And we have a lot of enhancements here. First of all, you can now have your custom AMIs, so OpsWorks can deploy instances based on your custom AMIs. It supports now Chef 11 for orchestration, version 11, supports ELB, monitoring, and several more instance types. Then, related to security, we have IAM, Identity and Access Management. It's really a best practice to use IAM to give granular control of user rights to your AWS resources. And the enhancements here are, for example, you can have resource level permissions, so really granular level permissions for EC2 security groups. We also now support Amazon, Facebook, and Google Identity Federation and variables in access control policies. Now, what are those? With the, with the variables, you can have processing logic in your IAM policies. So, for example, if you make a rule, that applies to your users. In the past, you would have to write rules for different users. So, basically, copy the rule, change the username, maybe change the settings, what they can do, the rule. But now, you can have a variable username, which is then replaced by the actual username in the processing logic. 
So this saves you a lot of copy pasting and it makes your IAM code more readable and shorter. Continuing on the security front, we have a completely new service. It's called Cloud HSM. Now what is Cloud HSM? Cloud HSM is a hardware-based key storage for regulatory compliance. It's, it's short for Hardware Security Module. It's actually a piece of hardware. It's a dedicated appliance that provides secure key storage and a set of cryptographic operations within a tamper-resistant enclosure. What does it do? You can store your keys within HSM and use these keys to encrypt and decrypt your data while keeping the keys themselves safe and sound and fully under your control. If you use Cloud HSM, you are the only one with access to the keys stored in this appliance. For more information on this obviously rich feature set, please visit the Cloud HSM pages at aws.amazon.com. Moving on, let's talk briefly about data pipeline. What is data pipeline? It helps you reliably process and move data between different AWS compute and storage services, as well as on-premise data sources at specified intervals. So the idea is that you would have daily or weekly or monthly runs where you have some source data in different places. Maybe you need to process it with EMR, Elastic Map Produce. Maybe you want to dump it in Red Sea for business intelligence, data warehousing, etc., to, to get your analytics out. So data pipeline is a really easy way to let you manage this. And now we have a new multi-region support. Now you can create a pipeline that includes resources like EC2 instances, Elastic MapReduce clusters in multiple AWS regions. For example, you can have a pipeline that launches an EMR cluster in Dublin, in our EU West region, and transfers the output to an S3 bucket in Tokyo, in Japan, for subsequent pro processing by an EC2 instance. Or, if your data is in Singapore, you can locate your resources in the same region as your data to minimize the latency. And it also supports different new instance types. As always, please visit aws.amazon.com and remember, you can get started with the free tier, which is a really handy way to get familiar with the different services. Okay, that was the webinar, main content. Now what? Now you may be wondering, now what? I recommend you to revisit your architecture. So based on this and the additional information at our website, take a look at your architecture. Leverage these new enhancements and features and optimize your system for cost, for high availability, etc. And then you can have success. Thank you. I'm Marco Lepista, technology evangelist at AWS AVAC, working out of Singapore. And as a reminder, our reInvent conference is coming up soon in Las Vegas in November. You can register now at the AWS Amazon.com website. I really recommend attending reInvent if you can. It's a super conference with amazing presenters and content with multiple different tracks. Hope to see you there. Now, let's move on to the Q&A. Hang on a second. There's a question on AWS policies for IAM. Well, IAM is a really complicated topic, so I recommend that you actually visit the IAM-specific website and documentation on aws.amazon.com. But in short, what is the difference? So if you don't use IAM, it means that you will be using your root AWS account for all the activities. And this is not a good idea, because then Especially if you have a larger organization, everybody has to, has to basically use your root account access to all of your AWS resources. So the recommendation is to use identity and access management, and also, by the way, multi-factor authentication if you 
want additional security. And with IAM, you can then specify, for example, groups of users. You have developers, you maybe have testers, you maybe have ops people, operational people, and they can do different things. So some of your user groups can launch, for example, dev test environments, but they cannot touch production systems. Operations people can operate, manage the production systems, but maybe they cannot do something else. So IAM is a highly recommended way of managing your resources in a secure manner. And there was a question about the beginning. You had a slide talking about vertical storage. Uh, vertically scaling, no. Well, we have two ways, a couple of ways of vertically scaling. It's probably referring to RDS, our National Database Service. So the idea with RDS is that you have the master database instance. So if you compare it to DynamoDB or SimpleDB, DynamoDB, for example, is a fully managed database service. You don't configure how many instances, etc. There's no such concept. You just use DynamoDB and you dial a knob, you say, I want this much read capacity, I want this much write capacity, and DynamoDB will then deliver this, this performance consistently with sub 10 millisecond consistent performance. So DynamoDB is an example of a fully managed zero management database NoSQL service. However, RDS, Relational Database Service, is a managed SQL database. So we support Oracle, MySQL, and Microsoft SQL Server. There, you have a database master running. So you have a master database instance running on an EC2 instance. We fully manage configuring it, creating it, patching it, etc. So you don't have to install, for example, MySQL. But you still have your own master database instance running. Now, vertical scaling in this case then means that you can modify the RDS instance and change it from a smaller to a larger instance type with more memory, networking performance, I.O., CPU, etc. Or to modify it to a smaller one. Remember, you can also add then read replicas, etc. But this is how vertical scaling works with RDS. Yes. When we talk about storage volumes, those refer to EBS, our Elastic Block Store. Basically, you just need to create a volume. And when you create the volume, you specify the size of the volume, up to one terabyte. And now you can specify also provisioned IOPS up to 4,000 IO operations per second. This is then how many IO operations per second this volume will provide consistently throughout the lifetime of the volume. I hope I answered the question. Then there's a question, what are the best practices for EC2 and S3 integration? Well, there are many, many, many ways. <laughs> there is no easy way to answer this. Basically, there are two different services. EC2 is where you run your virtual machine instances, and S3 is a super durable, remember S3 provides 11 nines of durability for the content that you store there. Now, obviously, you should leverage S3 in your application. So EBS is for block level access, where you have a file system, or for example, the database backend. S3 is where you store objects. They can be, for example, video files. They can be packages, whatever. How would you access those? Well, what happens is that you can store content first in, in all objects in S3. You can store them in multiple ways. We talked about the storage gateway today. You can use different methods of uploading your objects to S3. And then you get a reference. You get a pointer to this object. And then your EC2 applications running on EC2 instances are probably then looking at these S3 object pointers, fetching the object from S3, so downloading them, and then working on them, and maybe putting them back as modified objects. And I would use the SQS, simple queue service, to decouple these uh, application components where possible. Just a moment. Let's identify another question.
there is some there is somebody interested specifically in cloud HSM service. So if you are interested, please contact us at AWS. And there is also a trial possibility if you are interested. But please contact your AWS representative or let us know, and we will get back to you. What are the best practices to use EC2 and VPC? That's another question. Now, that is a complicated question now because now with the recent addition of default VPC, basically all the new accounts that are created are by default VPC. They behave like classic EC2, but actually they are VPC enabled. So why is this? We want the VPC enhancements and improvements over classic EC2 to be available easily to our new customers. So what is the difference? With VPC, you have much more granular control of security, networking interfaces, etc. I recommend that you study VPC in the AWS website for more information. And remember, a quite common best practice is to combine VPC with direct connect. That's something else that you may want to consider. There's a question on Elastic Beanstalk and VPC. And now Elastic Beanstalk supports VPC, yes. So you can run your Elastic Beanstalk applications or systems within VPC. Just a moment again, please. There's a question on S3, whether it's security enabled. Well, yes, you can, you can have encryption of your objects in S3. And remember that a lot of the security then can be managed through IAM, Identity and Access Management. There are several ways in S3 to control access control policies and rules to your objects, to your buckets, and to the users accessing these content. So yes, you can make it a highly secure object storage for yourself. Then there's a question, how is the session handling done in a web application hosted on Amazon Cloud with which is spread across multiple instances. Well, the best practice here that I recommend is to use two services in combination, ELB or Elastic Load Balancing and Auto Scaling Groups. So basically, what you need then is that you need your AMI, your Amazon Machine Image, and when you spin up instances from this AMI, you get your application stack running, right? How would ELB and Auto Scaling help? Well, you want your website or your service to respond to traffic spikes. So first of all, you would create an auto-scaling group. And in an auto-scaling group, you define what are the rules. So when do I actually scale out? When do I add more instances of this application tier to meet the increasing demand? And vice versa, when do I save cost and remove instances when I don't need so many when the traffic goes down? This is what auto-scaling lets you do. Basically, it integrates with CloudWatch. You can configure which performance metrics, which CloudWatch metrics indicate that your instances are getting hot and they need help by adding more instances. And vice versa, how do you detect that your instances are quite cool and you can remove instances and save cost without hurting your KPIs? So auto scaling lets you scale out and scale in by adding and removing EC2 instances from the same AMI. You would then integrate this with ELB, Elastic Load Balancing, because you need one common entry point to your service. And then your customers would be using this IP address or this domain name for the traffic. It's pointing to an ELB load balancer. It's not just one. It's multiple instances of ELB. And then ELB will health check your instances in the autoscaling group and direct traffic to alive or nicely working healthy instances. So, in short, please use ELB and auto scaling together. Now we have time for one more question. Can anyone make a presentation for enterprise disaster recovery and data backups? What is the advantage over the traditional DR site? Absolutely, definitely. 
So we have some existing presentations and webinars already, but we definitely value customer feedback. So this is something that we will take into consideration, and I think it's time that we will soon make this kind of webinar for your benefit. So please also vote in, the, in your feedback later, uh, and let us know if you would like to see this kind of webinar. But it sounds good to me. Now, it's time to finish. And as the last slide, just a reminder, at the end of the webinar, please complete the survey. We super, super much value your feedback. Let us know what's good, what's not, how you want to improve this, what you would like AWS to deliver to you next. And then, as a reminder, once you complete the survey, you get $25 worth of AWS credits. Thank you very much. I'm Marco Lepiste. It's been a pleasure. And until the next time. See you later. Bye-bye.